Hey everybody, it's time we talk about the Kalos Elite Four. One of the more forgettable Elite Fours in my opinion, though I do like them, they all have great music and cool character designs and their rooms do look nice. And just so we're clear, since I have a habit of forgetting to include this part, the goal of this video is to recreate their teams for a hypothetical hard mode, if Pokemon ever included that in their games. Something to give an experienced player a challenge without going to the extreme end with Kaizo difficulty. Seabold is the Elite Four's resident water type expert. He's also a chef. One look at him makes me think he's had to deal with an abundance of aggravating customers during his time. I haven't done anything to him, but he looks ready to fight me personally and leave his Pokemon out of this. He leads with Cloitzer at level 63 with a Mega Launcher ability and the moves Water Pulse, Dark Pulse, Dragon Pulse, and Aura Sphere. Mega Launcher powers up Aura and Pulse moves by 50%, which turns out to be all of his moves. So don't worry, Water Pulse. It's on par with Surf strength wise and has more PP, and has a nice 20% chance to confuse. Dark Pulse and Aura Sphere go from 80 base power to 120, and Dragon Pulse goes from 85 base power to 127.5 base power. I really like this synergy between the ability and moveset. I will say though, the few problems I have with Cloitzer is that its speed is kinda slow, so it misses out on Dark Pulse flinching, and its bulk is only average, which isn't amazing for how slow it is. Overall though, it's a cool lead Pokemon. Out second is Gyarados at level 63 with the Intimidate ability and knowing Waterfall, Ice Fang, Earthquake and Dragon Dance. Let my man cook. We have a great ability. Intimidate debuffing the player's Pokemon's attack stat by one, making Gyarados feel much more tanky. Though it is either this ability or Moxie, so it's a win-win either way. We have Awesome Stab in Waterfall that can also flinch. Ice Fang coverage is the weakest aspect I suppose in this moveset, but it's still really solid. Earthquake is a great coverage move that hits Gyarados' biggest threat, Electric types, and Dragon Dance is an awesome setup move, boosting attack and speed by one stage. Of course, the big problem is still Electric types, or any fast Pokemon with a strong Electric move can likely kill Gyarados before it can do anything, but we can't really complain about seeing Gyarados, can we? Third up is Starmie at level 63 with the Illuminate ability with the moves Dazzling Gleam, Psychic, Surf, and Light Screen. So, drop the ball a little bit here, not completely, but... A few things to note. First of all, Starmie is a great Pokemon, it's strong and fast, with good coverage that isn't completely taken advantage of here. Though setting up a fast light screen could hold some value against any Thunderbolt who is trying to clean sweep his team. And Dazzling Gleam does provide an option for dark types. For the ability, Illuminate, it does nothing here. Starmie has two other abilities that would at least have a use in battle. Well, maybe not natural cure since the AI hates switching out, but still, it could potentially have a use. So not a bad Pokemon overall, just some flaws here and there. Seabolt's ace is Barbarical at level 65 with the Tough Claws ability as the moves Cross Chop, Stone Edge, Razor Shell and X Scissor. Tough Claws boosts the power of contact moves by 1.3 times, so that's all of these moves except for Stone Edge. Here's their old and new base power on screen for the number nerds out there. Again, like Cloitzer, I love to see this moveset keep in mind the ability, since it is such an impactful ability. It's a powerful moveset that is going for big damage right out the gate and the stat distribution is decent, but it does leave itself very vulnerable to grass type moves. Overall a strong ace that works well as long as the players aren't using a grass move, which the player probably is considering they could have Chespin or Bulbasaur for free. So here's Seabold's team. Spoilers, but I think he might have the strongest lineup of all the Elite Four members in terms of movesets, abilities, and Pokemon used. And water type being water type, aka really good. Despite this, due to these bosses being quite underleveled, the player may not be able to really appreciate the team composition Seabold actually has. Let's tweak his team, add some held items, and raise those levels. Seabold's new lead will be Politoed, at level 68 with Ability Drizzle and Holding the Damp Rock. Its moves are Scald, Psychic, Mud Bomb, and Hydro Pump. We're letting the endgame water type expert here use Rain to its advantage. Luckily with Politoed existing, there's no need to spend a turn to set up Hail, like my version of Wolfric had to. As Scald for a strong rain boosted water stab that potentially could inflict a burn, Psychic is a good neutral option for the water resist, as well as being super effective against a fair amount of grass types, including the two grass type starters the player could have. Mud Bomb isn't amazingly powerful at base 65, but a secondary effect of lowering accuracy 30% of the time will create free turns by forcing additional switches from the player to reset that debuff. Lastly, Hydro Pump is there as a nuke move, with a usable 80% accuracy for that power. Second out is Lantern at level 68 with the Volt Absorb ability and holding a Chesto Berry. Its moveset is Thunder, Surf, Ice Beam and Rest. 
Not using a lantern on a rain team here would be criminal in my opinion. And it helps a lot with electric types considering it's immune to those moves. And we have a classic Resto Chesto set taking advantage of lantern solid bulk. For offensive moves we have Thunder's 110 base power. 70% accurate but cannot miss in the rain. With a nice 30% power chance on top. Surf for strong stab in the rain and ice beam to deal with grass types. Next is Gyarados at level 68 with Intimidate for its ability and holding a Wakan Berry. It'll have the moves Waterfall, Ice Fang, Earthquake and Dragon Dance. First of all, the Wakan Berry has the damage from Super Effective Electric Attack. With Gyarados' decent bulk, it could believably tank hit now. I've not changed the moveset at all here. As I stated, the original moveset was one of the most competent sets I've actually seen in this game. Many useful physical options like Bounce or Iron Head aren't available in Gen 6 until Oras. As such, my options were basically Ice Fang or Stone Edge, and while Stone Edge has the power, I ultimately feel like that Ice Fang is handier for its secondary effects. 10% chance to flinch or 10% chance to freeze. For the ability Intimidate, it was tough not being persuaded by Moxie, an ability I do love, but I think the Intimidate ability, either helping Gyarados tank a turn to set up Dragon Dance, or force the player to swap out and set up a Dragon Dance is probably a more consistent ability to make use of for the AI. Out fourth is Barbarical at level 69 with a tough claws ability and holding the focus sash. Its moves are Razor Shell, Poison Jab, Stone Edge, and Shell Smash. We have a scary setup sweeper here. Shell Smash is one of the wildest boosting moves there is. It lowers the user's defense and special defense, but grants the user plus two in attack, special attack, and speed. And with the Focus Sash, it near guarantees it'll survive to set up or land a heavy hit. On top of that, Tough Claws boost the power of moves that make contact by 1.3 times, and Stone Edge unfortunately doesn't make contact, but serves as a very powerful rock stab all the same. As long as it hits. Overall this Pokemon will still crumble to a grass type attack, but if it's allowed a turn of setup it'll become a very scary sweeper. Outlast is the ace, Mega Blastoise at level 70 with the Mega Launcher ability. We'll have the moves Water Pulse, Dark Pulse, Aura Sphere and Dragon Pulse. Essentially we've just upgraded the Cloitzer to a Mega Blastoise. In every regard Blastoise has higher stats, along with a higher level, and this will help the Mega Launcher strat be put to a more effective use. I'll turn a defensive Mon into a very potent attacker, with devastating coverage and all while boasting solid bulk. Here's Seabold's new team. Now somewhat of a rain team, which while strengthens the player if they have thunder on their Pokemon, we've kept in mind a couple of counterplays to electric types, such as Lantern's Immunity, Gyarados's Berry, and Barbarical's Focus Sash. To help deal with grass types, we've provided a wider variety of coverage moves that deal super effective damage to the majority of the grass types in the game. Lastly, despite not having any moves that purely inflict status like Toxic, Seabold has a lot of moves that inflict different sorts of status, such as Scald Burns, Thunder Paralyzing, Poison Jabs for Poison, and even Ice Beam and Ice Fang's Rare Freeze. The only status we don't have is Sleep, except for Lantern putting itself to sleep, I suppose. Malva, the Fire-type expert, she's an Elite Four member, a news reporter, and is part of Team Flare which I believe she's the only Leap 4 member to be part of the evil team up until this point in the series anyway. Her lead is Pyroar at level 63, with Rivalry as its ability, and it knows Hyper Voice, Flamethrower, Wild Charge, and Noble Roar. This moveset is fine, sort of. I mean, we have solid stab moves here. Wild Charge is odd since it's a physical move, and Pyroar definitely isn't a physical attacker, despite the fact that its inability is Moxie for god knows why. Aside from that, it's not a great move, but... At least it maybe helps against water types. I don't really think a non-stab wild charge from Pyro will do much to a Gyarados after it intimidates it, but whatever. Oh, and lastly, Noble Roar is honestly a move I can get behind. It lowers attack and special attack by one stage, and with Pyro's high speed, it can maybe go first? Maybe not since it's underleveled. If it does though, it can inflict a debuff that's guaranteed to have some value. Also, shout out to Lord Envy who made a hilarious Noble Roar Wailord set. Check out this video if you like competitive Pokemon. It's honestly really fun. Anyway, this move set, yeah, it's just okay. Good stabs, a status move that at least does something. Just nothing too special going on here, really. But I guess nothing to be too ashamed of. Out second is Torkoal at level 63 with the White Smoke ability. It has the moves Curse, Earthquake, Stone Edge, and Flame Wheel. Hold on, the positives here. Earthquake and Stone Edge are awesome coverage moves, especially Earthquake dealing with one of Fire Type's weaknesses in Rock. White Smoke is a solid ability as well that blocks any and all stat debuffs, especially since this was before it got the Drought ability. Now, Flame Wheel. Look, it doesn't actually get any better Fire Physical Stab, and we've got ourselves a Physical Setup Mon here, so really it was either that or Flamethrower or something. After one curse, Flame Wheel becomes on par with a Flamethrower power-wise, since they have 
identical base 85 offences, though I'd probably have just preferred if it was a mixed set. Talking about Curse, yeah it is nice that it doesn't care about a speed debuff, but a slow Pokemon with an exploitable defence is not likely to last long in this world. So again, this isn't shameful levels are bad, just a bit underwhelming and exploitable. Third is Chandelure at level 63 with a Flame Body ability. It knows Flamethrower, Shadow Ball, Confuse Ray and Confide. Sort of similar to Pyroar here, we have nice stab moves but then it falls off a bit. Confuse Ray is okay at best, just a double edged sword really on if it'll help at all. But at least in Gen 6, Confusion is still is a 1 in 2 chance rather than in Gen 7 where it only becomes a 1 in 3. And Confide just lowers the target special attack by 1, so half as good as Noble Roar. Honestly a bit of a baffling move here. Chandelure gets some nice coverage moves, especially an energy ball that deals with all three of fire types weaknesses, rock, ground and water. Honestly, grass is a great coverage option for fire to have. Anyway, overall this moveset, yeah it's fine again. Seems like Malva is just the queen of acceptable movesets that aren't anything special. Her ace is Talonflame at level 65 with the flame body ability, L, with the moves Brave Bird, Flare Blitz, Flail and Quick Attack, Big L. Two good stab moves, an odd choice in flail but okay. Fast flail could do something at some point and quick attack is actually shameful. Downright sickening. Talonflame has a unique ability called Gale Wings. Now while Flame Body is a fine ability, compared to Gen 6 Gale Wings there is no competition. It provides priority to every flying move, status or attacking. No downside, no strings attached. Yet Malva decided to forego that and go for quick attack. Talonflame only has a base 126 speed anyway. It's honestly a really odd choice to me. And I let out a slight chortle, a noticeable guffaw, perhaps, when I found this out. But you know what? It's okay. At least it has two strong stab moves, so it could be worse. Here's Malva's team. It's kind of just okay. There's a lack of good options to deal with any of Fire type's weaknesses, aside from Torkoal's Earthquake for Rock types. The moves overall are okay, but have a big room for improvement. So let's see what we can do. Out first is still her Pyroar, now at level 68 with the Unnerve ability and holding the Heat Rock. We'll have the moves Hyper Voids, Flamethrower, Will-O-Wisp and Sunny Day. Unfortunately, Ninetales is not on the Kalos Pokedex and as such we have no available Drought users to auto set up the Sun. Sorry Malva. That being said, setting up Sun really does help out Fire types, halving the damage of Water types and enabling some of them to use one turn Solar Beams. Will-O-Wisp can put the pressure on statusing the player early. Its ability choices aren't great, so we'll put on a nerve to at least make sure it doesn't debuff itself with rivalry. Out second is still Torkoal at level 68 with the ability Shell Armor and holding a Power Herb. Its moves are Fire Blast, Solar Beam, Earthquake and Amnesia. I opted for Shell Armor over White Smoke, both great abilities, but Shell Armor preventing critical hits should help avoid Torkoal getting one shot by an unfortunate crit. If it's not Sunny, then Power Herb will guarantee it gets one Solar Beam off in one turn providing a powerful attack for the majority of Fire Types worst matchup. Fire Blast will provide great stab coverage, especially in the sun, and Earthquake is just an awesome coverage move. Lastly, we have Amnesia to patch up its lower defensive stat, and after one turn of Amnesia being used, it'll be very bulky on both sides of the spectrum. Out third is Chandelure at level 68 with the Flame Body ability, holding a Salak Berry. It'll know Flamethrower, Shadow Ball, Energy Ball, and Calm Mind. Chandelure is aiming to become a sweeper, with absurd special attack, after one can mind and its solid offensive moves, it will be able to hurt any Pokemon significantly. Also holding a Salic Berry gives it a plus one to speed if it gets below 25% health. This item may be a little bit inconsistent, but it is something the player will need to be wary of if they can't straight up Oko it, as activating the berry means hardly anything can outspeed Chandelure with its decent enough base 80 speed. Should a moveset work out, this could be a terrifying sweeper for the player to deal with. Fourth is Talonflame at level 69 with the Gale Wings ability and holding the leftovers. Its moves are Brave Bird, Flare Blitz, Swords Dance and Roost. Gen 6 Talonflame is a bit of a menace, Gale Wings making every flying type move, including moves such as Roost, priority is awesome. Setting up a Swords Dance into either Brave Bird or Flare Blitz will do massive damage and we've given it leftovers to partially mitigate recoil from those moves. It's not a tanky Pokemon but it may give it another turn to attack without fainting, instead of needing to use Roost. Outlast is her Mega Hound Doom at level 70, with the Solar Power ability. It knows Fire Blast, Dark Pulse, Sludge Bomb and Sunny Day. I opted for Fire Blast over Flamethrower to really let her Mega go all out. Dark Pulse has a really handy secondary effect of flinching 20% of the time, which complements Mega Houndoom's solid base 115 speed stat. The Solar Power ability may come into play. It boosts Mega Houndoom's special attack by 50% when in the sun, but costs 1 8th of its health every turn, even if it doesn't attack. So it is quite risky. That being said, Sun and Solar Power Fire Blast will cook anything in her path. Here's Malva's new team. 
We've not swapped much, in fact we only added a Mega and changed her existing Pokemon's moves, items and abilities, because I don't think there's any other better options, apart from Delphox, but I may be arbitrarily trying to avoid giving starters wherever possible. But looking at the list, there was Flareon, Heatmore, Macargo, Simiseer, nothing that really made sense to replace her existing team with. So we've given them a significant move upgrades and better ways to deal with the three fire type weaknesses in rock, ground and water. Wickstrom is a steel type lad. He's a descendant of a family of knights. In fact, the suit of armor he wears is a family heirloom passed down through generations. And hold on, in his artwork he appears to be holding a yellow pokeball. Or a TM? What is my man's plan here? I mean, I guess they're just his custom Pokeballs, but no other Elite Four has that to my knowledge, and this is the gem that turned TMs from regular Pokeballs to yellow Pokeballs. So all I'm saying is, it's just a funny coincidence. He leads with a Clef Key at level 63 with a Prankster ability, and it knows Dazzling Gleam, Flash Cannon, Torment, and Spike. Not a Pokemon I would expect a medieval knight looking guy to have, but I can believe it. Could be the keys to the dungeon or something when he has to lock up a peasant for stealing a peach from the orchard. Klefki may not be top tier stat wise, but it has some cool things going for it. Chiefly, it's incredible type combo in Steel and Fairy. Just look at this type matchup chart. So many resists and two immunities. It's a good stab here, and Prankster Spikes is nice to give them the option to set up at least one layer quickly. However, the flaw I see here is Torment. It's just not a great move in general, unless the player is doing a solo challenge and can't switch. But yeah, it's not a great use of a move slot. Overall though, it's an interesting lead with a good type, middling stats, solid stabs, and a cheeky ability to set up an entry hazard from the get-go. Out second is Probopass at level 63 with a sturdy ability. It has Power Gem, Flash Cannon, Earth Power, and Discharge. At least stat-wise you'd assume we have a tank here, but we have four attacking moves on it. This isn't horrible as Probopass does have base 75 special attack and these moves do provide a good amount of coverage, though nothing to hit the average ground or fighting type super effectively, both of which deal 4 times damage to this rock steel type. Having sturdy is good, so Probopass can almost always live a hit and deal some damage back, though it'd just be middling damage at most. That being said, stats move wise, Probopass isn't anything to write home about, unless you want to do toxic, sturdy, pain split Probopass at level 5 or something, but I don't really think that'd be an honourable thing to do for this chivalrous Elite 4 member. Out third is Scizor at level 63 with the Technician ability. It knows Bullet Punch, X Scissor, Iron Head, and Night Slash. Some good things. Scizor is sick. I think at least 95% of you will all agree with that. It has solid stats. Technician boosted Bullet Punch is awesome, though none of its other moves are boosted. To be fair though, Bug Bite is learnt via a certain move tutor, and no move tutors teach that in X and Y apparently. And Thief over Night Slash doesn't really make sense for a chivalrous knight, so I can't really fault this moveset too much. All in all, a cool Pokemon to see. Lastly is his Ace, Aegislash at level 65 with the ability stance change. Its moveset is King Shield, Sacred Sword, Shadow Claw and Iron Head. Thematically, this one is 100% on point. I wouldn't be surprised if they created this Knight character just so they could show off Aegislash. It's a very solid Pokemon and while the AI probably can't utilize it to the same level a player can, it was banned to Ubers and Gen 6 competitive, so yeah, this is a powerful Ace. It has a very strong type combo, with its ability changing its stat from defensive to offensive, and utilising King Shield to help switch back and forth, as well as harshly lowering the player's Pokemon's attack stat should they make contact with it on that turn. When battling against him, I thought he was following a pattern switching back and forth between King Shield and attacking, but I was wrong, so predicting when they'll attack and protect isn't straightforward, at least to me. The rest of its moveset is respectable as well. Two decent stab moves, though I'd maybe take Shadow Ball over Claw, and Secret Sword is a great 90 base power, 100% accurate fighting move that has the added bonus of ignoring any defense or even evasion boosts the player could have. So overall, this is a pretty cool lead and actually took me several turns to defeat, despite it being several levels lower than me. Here's Wickstrom's team. Overall, I can't fault it too much. Propass might be the weakest one purely because I value the entry hazard set of potential Klefki brings. But even then, Propass definitely isn't the worst addition he could have had. Overall a competent team that's mainly held back by X and Y under leveling their boss battles. Let's give him an update. His lead is still Klefki, now at level 68 with Prankster for its ability and holding an Aka Berry. His moves are Draining Kiss, Flash Cannon, Cam Mind and Spikes. Aka Berry reduces a super effective fire attack by half and for the moves we swap Dazzling Gleam for Draining Kiss and Torment for Cam Mind. The idea here is to potentially set up a Cam Mind or two and use Flash Cannon for big damage. 
or draining kiss for moderate damage and a large amount of healing, since this move lets you recover 75% back of the damage you dealt. Out second is a Scavalier at level 68 with the ability Shell Armor, and holding an Expert Belt, its moves are Mega Horn, Iron Head, Drill Run, and Knock Off. How could I not give the Knight character the Jousting Pokemon? Stat wise, it's also solid with outstanding attack and respectable bolt. Its letdown is its speed, which is a bit surprising for a Jousting Pokemon, but it had to take a hit somewhere. For its moves, we got two strong stabs, Knock Off to rid the player's held items, and Drill Run provides some sort of counterplay against its only weakness, Fire Types, if it somehow manages to survive a hit from one. The held item, the Expert Belt, boosting damage from super effective moves by 20% is more useful on a Pokemon like this that has four differently typed attacking moves in its kit, especially when one of these moves is here to hit its worst matchup. Out third is Skarmory at level 68 with sturdy for its ability and holding leftovers. It knows Steel Wing, Drill Peck, Rock Slide and Roost. Alright, so Skarmory I decided on adding with its Pokedex entries. It said that people once used their feathers as swords. I know I don't always go this far with the team theme, but turns out a medieval knight character is plenty of Pokemon that strongly fit its theme. Anyway, Skarmory here being a bulkier Pokemon has the sturdy ability and is holding leftovers, along with Roost to keep it healthy. Meanwhile, it can dish out fair damage with its stab moves, and Rock Slide is to help deal with fire types, especially any Talonflames or Charizard slash Charizard Ys out there. By and large, the plan is to stay healthy and chip down the player's Pokemon. Out fourth is Aegislash Slash at level 69 with the stance change ability and holding a red card. His moves are King Shield, Sacred Sword, Shadow Ball and Flash Cannon. We've not changed much here, but we've changed the stat moves from physical to special, since in this rework Wickstrom is leaning more on the physical side and is lacking a bit on the special side. And we've equipped it with a red card. This interesting item forces the player to randomly switch out should Aegislash tank the initial hit, which given its defensive stats is fairly likely. This can disrupt any momentum the player may have built up to this point, though they can still play around this a bit if they are aware of the item beforehand. Lastly, his Mega, Mega Scissor at level 70 with the ability Technician, and the moves Bullet Punch, X Scissor, Air Release, and Sword Stance. Not too different from his regular Scissor, but we tried to capitalize a little bit more on the Technician ability with Air Release being boosted to 90 base power, and now we have Sword Stance to become a sweeping machine with Technician boosted Bullet Punches at his disposal. A pretty straightforward setup move, three attack Pokemon we have here, and Mega Scissor has good stats for such a task. Here's Wickstrom's team, we've leaned more into his knight theming and provided him with some unique tools that the player wouldn't have really faced up until this point. Overall, I've tried to make his team a lot more balanced in offense, defense, physical and special. Drasna, the dragon type expert, unlike her predecessors, she has a rather friendly appearance and personality, and is hopefully a law abiding citizen unlike someone. Apparently a glitch can happen if you use Aura Sphere in our Pokemon. If that's true, I'll put some gameplay footage of it happening. She leads with Dragology at level 63 with a Poison Point ability. It knows the moves Dragon Pulse, Sludge Bomb, Surf and Thunderbolt. An interesting lead with a unique type combo, at least up until this point. This gives Dragology 4 weaknesses but a respectable 7 resists. It leans more especially defensively but has a solid enough base 97 special attack stat. Two strong stab moves, and Surf is useful at dealing with one of its weakness, ground types. And Thunderbolt, I can't really complain about that, I suppose. However, I wish Drasna used Dragology's other ability, Adaptability. This turns the same type attack bonus of Poison and Dragon from 1.5 times to 2 times, thus drastically increasing its damage output. Poison Point isn't the worst ability out there, but compared to Adaptability, there shouldn't really be a choice. Overall, I don't hate this lead, but easily some room for improvement here. Second out is Dredagon at level 63 with the Rough Skin ability, as the moves Dragon Tail, Revenge, Retaliate, and Chip Away. Rough Skin is a nice ability, any move making contact makes the player Pokemon lose 1 8th its max HP. The moveset though is sort of odd. Dragon Tail being your only stab isn't great. Revenge is decent, since you're likely to be slower anyway. Retaliate is guaranteed to at least be used at double power, considering Dredagon is not the lead slot, so it's a strong attack for only one turn. And Chip Away is underwhelming. It works just like Sacred Sword, except it's weaker and normal type, so it's way worse. Also, Chip Away and Dragon Tail I don't feel like have the best synergy together. Both are there to help deal with Pokemon that may have boosted their stats, having both moves feel a bit over the top. If I had to pick one though, definitely Dragon Tail over Chip Away. I like Dredagon, but this to me has missed the mark quite a bit. Third out is Altaria at level 63 with a natural cure ability. Its moves are Moonblast, Dragon Pulse, Cotton Guard, and Sing. 
Fairy Dragon moves are a decent combo for neutral coverage, it only struggles to hit steel types, but everything else is fair game. Cotton Guard is pretty cool as well, being a very rare setup move that boosts defense by 3 stages in 1. That being said, it won't save you from any special ice moves, and Wolfric just gave the player ice beam not long ago. Lastly, Sing is, well, sleep is nice to inflict, but Sing has 55% accuracy, so it's very dicey on if it'll help or waste a turn. And Natural Cure probably won't come into play here, only helping a Voltaria status, and then swaps out. Something the AI is notorious for doing, right everyone? So Altaria here doesn't seem that scary to the average team. Any Steel type, or Ice Beamer, and you'll be fine. Her Ace is Noivern at level 65 with the Frisk ability, and the moves Air Slash, Dragon Pulse, Flamethrower, and Super Fang. Fairly straightforward moveset here, two decent stab moves, Air Slash's 30% flinches are nice on a Pokemon with that fast of a speed stat. Flamethrower helps deal with the Steel and Ice types as well. And Super Fang is not the move I'd use, but at least it's guaranteed 50% HP if used on a full health Mon. Which honestly is good damage for the AI considering the disadvantage they're at, level and EV wise. Something I'm not too sure about though is Frisk. Does the AI actually know what to do with that information? In fact I tested this by loading up the game again with my Florges holding a Rocky Helmet. I chose Florges since maybe with its high special defense the AI would be more likely to opt for Super Fang over its special attacks. It uses Super Fang turn 1 and then never again. Until randomly, after some healing and switching, and I'm on roughly 80% health, it super fangs again. I tested this another time by equipping Florges with the leftovers and setting up cam mines, trying to bait the AI into using super fangs. It used super fang even less initially, only air slashing until running out, then super fanging only when my health was high enough. So my answer to can AI utilize Frisk is maybe not with certain items. Right, enough with that. Noivern is overall though a decent ace, with strong offensive moves and a high speed, to actually use them. Here's Drasna's team. Like many dragon trainers, she is deathly afraid of ice types. And now fairy types do a number on her team as well, once you get past the initial dragology. Let's rework her team with these weak points in mind. Her new lead is Hydreigon at level 68 with the levitate ability and holding the expert belt. It'll know the moves Dragon Pulse, Dark Pulse, Earthquake and Flash Cannon. Two strong stab moves, Earthquake for physical coverage, and Flash Cannon to get the jump on Fairies, looking to hit it for its 4 times weakness, as well as holding the Expert Belt to boost the damage of super effective attacks by 20%. Her lead is designed to take on a wide array of Pokemon and prevent them from setting up, though it'll get one shot by any Fairy move. It can at least likely get the first attack, with its high enough speed stat of 98, outspeeding the majority of Fairy types in Gen 6. Trigology is out second, at level 68 with the Adaptability ability, <laughs> and on an Air Balloon. It has the move Sludge Wave, Dragon Pulse, Surf, and Shadow Ball. Adaptability was a no-brainer here. It's an awesome ability turning Stab from 1.5 to 2 times, making those Sludge Waves and Dragon Pulses deal massive damage to anything that doesn't resist. Surf stays to help deal with any ground types, as well as the Air Balloon helping avoid a ground type attack. And Shadow Ball helps deal with any Psychic types. Though with Adaptability our Stab attacks are actually slightly stronger still, there are Pokemon Shadow Ball is preferable on, such as Aegislash. Third out is Kingdra, at level 68 with the sniper ability and holding the scope lens. It'll know the moves Draco Meteor, Waterfall, Ice Beam and Focus Energy. If anyone played competitive singles in Gen 6, you may have seen people run Sniper, Scope Lens, Focus Energy, Kingdra. For those who don't know, Sniper turns critical hits from 1.5 times to 2.25 times, Scope Lens provides a plus 1 to crit ratio and Focus Energy provides a plus 2 to the crit ratio, totaling the crit ratio to plus 3 which starting in Gen 6 means you have 100% crit rate. This combos nicely with Draco Meteor where it lowers Kingdra's special attack by 2 each time it's used. Though with critical hits, they ignore the user's attack debuffs, so no downside to spamming Draco Meteors then. That being said, it does come at a cost of needing to set up for a turn, but with Kingdra's relatively few weaknesses and reasonable bulk, I do think it's doable. The other two moves are straightforward here, Waterfall for Stab and Flinching and Ice Beam for Coverage. Out fourth is Noivern at level 69 with the Infiltrator ability and holding a Life Orb. Its moves are Air Slash, Dragon Pulse, Focus Blast, and Flamethrower. Life Orb providing a 1.3 times power boost as well. Focus Blast and Flamethrower helps deal with the Steel types that might try to wall her team. Her new A's and Mega is Garchomp, a level 70 with the Sand Force ability. Before that, it'll have Rough Skin, and its moves are Outrage, Earthquake, Stone Edge, and Flamethrower. Mega Garchomp has amazing stats. A base stat total of 700 is the highest the player will have faced so far, I think. Though that being said, it's funny that this thing is worse and competitive than regular Garchomp. Though with that being said, this is in-game, and overall Mega Garchomp should be a solid upgrade. It has absurd attack and solid special attack. 
It's a shame we can't get any use out of its ability, which boosts the power of rock, ground and steel type attacks by 30% when a sandstorm is active. But we need to replace a move with sandstorm and setting that up for 5 turns for a 30% power boost just seems less useful than outright attacking. Still, Mega Garchomp should prove to be a scary encounter for the player, especially one without an ice or fairy type. Here's Drazen's new team, who provided her with Pokemon that have movesets to deal with fairy and ice types. She leads with a pseudo legendary and has her Mega Garchomp in the back, so any player without a strong matchup may want to leave her until the end. Here she is, Champion Diantha. We've ran into her a few times up until this point. Initially when having a very normal conversation with Lysander in Limeo City, where he thinks she should remain beautiful and young forever, because Lysander is a bit of a weirdo. She on the other hand, embraces change. So Diantha should be 100% on board with me redesigning her team then. Let's see what we're working with. She leads with Holucha at level 64 with the Limber ability. It knows Swords Dance, Flying Press, X Scissor and Poison Jab. At first I was confused by her using this, but after some thought I can see the reason why. Being a luchador, acting out a fight makes sense for an actress to have. Gameplay wise, apart from being 7 levels below my Pokemon, this isn't a bad lead. Set up sweeper with 3 attacks, flying press for that 2 in 1 stab, to give her 2 coverage moves is interesting. x deals with psychics, and poison jab deals with fairies. Though like Karina's, this Holucha struggles to deal with ghost types. Also, it's using probably the worst ability it could have, Unburden and Moldbreaker have greater potential. Out second is Tyrantrum, at level 65 with strong jaw for its ability, and it knows Head Smash, Earthquake, Dragon Claw, and Crunch. Again, a nice move set here. Strong jaw only boosting Crunch feels a bit underutilized, when she could have also used Rock Head to remove Head Smash's massive 50% recoil, but nice to see an ability help out at least a little bit. Earthquake is useful against Steel types, and Crunch is just a useful base 120 power attack. Next out is Aurorus at level 65, with the Refrigerate ability, and it was Thunder, Blizzard, Light Screen, and Reflect. So you've lost me a bit here. Refrigerate turning normal type attacks into ice and boosting their power by 1.3 times is an awesome ability, but it's completely useless with no normal moves. Thunder and Blizzard to make sure you'll miss it at some point. Also, Aurorus gets Snow Warning. With Blizzard, that could have been nice, but never mind, I guess. And Reflect and Light Screen being on a Pokemon with this many weaknesses is quite odd. I mean, this is a bulky Pokemon, it just doesn't feel right, especially when the other moves are 70% accurate. This is a weird one. Also, it's funny how so far she's only used Pokemon, or at least the evolved forms, of Gym Leader's aces. Out fourth is Gorgeist at level 65 with a pickup ability. Its moves are Phantom Force, Seed Bomb, Shadow Sneak, and Trick or Treat. Three solid moves here. Trick or Treat is actually Gorgeist's signature move, and it adds Ghost type to the opposing Pokemon, which can give its Ghost type moves super effective or at least neutral coverage. The only problem here is that this move sucks. You spend a turn to give your Pokemon a generally decent defensive type. If it replaced the opponent's type for pure ghost, that could be nicer as it removes the stab bonus, but still probably not worth a move slot for the AI. It's an interesting move, but I don't see it having much value here. Oh, and pick up for the ability could come into play. If the player's Pokemon consumes an item like a berry, pick up then picks up that item and lets the user hold it. Which, you know, this won't affect much and barely even happen in the first place, but hey, Fringe cases, folks, don't think I'm not considering them. Out fifth is Gudra at level 55 with a Sap Sip ability. Its moves are Dragon Pulse, Muddy Water, Fire Blast, and Focus Blast. So we have an all out special attacker here. Good moves, though a bit inaccurate. Having Sap Sipper will raise attack when hit by a grass move and be immune to them, which is nice, but we have no physical attacks, which Gudra could do considering it's fairly balanced defensively, which might surprise some of you. Though being immune to things like Leech Seed and Sleep Powder is still very valuable in that alone. It's not a bad Pokemon, and it's funny that it's probably the reason Drasna doesn't use one. Also, fourth Pokemon on her team, weak to eyes moves. For having a diverse team, it's weird that such a big weak point exists. Though maybe that just goes to show the strength of ice moves offensively. And it's time for the ace, Mega Gardevoir at level 68, with Trace which turns into Pixelate upon Mega Evolving. Its moves are Moonblast, Psychic, Shadow Ball, and Thunderbolt. 4 strong special attacks, and Moonblast is a very good move, annoyingly so actually. Gen 6 nerfed all the elemental attacks like Flamethrower from 95 to 90, only to have Moonblast come in and be 95, and have its secondary effect be 30% chance to activate over 10. Also, it lowers special attack, which is honestly a really nice secondary effect. Not gonna lie, as someone that doesn't really care for the fairy types, Moonblast as a move annoys me greatly, but putting that to one side, 
Mega Gardevoir is a pretty solid ace, decent typing, great stats, and the good moves. It's an ace that truly fits Diantha thematically as well. So all in all, respectable end to this sort of underwhelming fight. Here's Diantha's team in full, sporting good diversity in types and attacks, some weird flaws like the majority being weak to ice, Aurora's moveset, and Refrigerate and Pixelate having no use. Although, looking at Gardevoir's moveset, getting Pixelate to have some use is kind of awkward pre ORAS. Oh, and her team is just generally a bit underleveled. She's probably one of the weakest champions compared to the average player's strength up until this point in the series, thanks to the XP share. Also, I just found this out. I'm recording this way later than my initial commentary, but turns out Diantha's team also, on top of just being generally weak level-wise, their IVs are 8 across the board, which is odd because all the other boss battles in the game, they have IVs of 22. Why does the champion have less IVs than the Elite Four? It makes no sense. Uh, just, why is Game Freak like this? Back to me that's further in the past than this little recording snippet. Before getting into our new team, I just want to say this was the toughest trainer I've had to rework so far. Something about the Kalos Pokedex, trying to not reuse the same Pokemon and diversifying her team to have no glaring weak points proved to be a huge task for me. So much so, I actually made a post asking for everyone's thoughts on what Pokemon could work for her. So I just want to thank everybody that commented on that post and it really helped me. Her new lead is Rose Raid at level 70 with a Poison Point ability and holding a Focus Sash. Its moves are Sludge Bomb, Energy Ball, Shadow Ball and Toxic Spikes. We have the Focus Sash to allow Rose Raid to survive any one hit on 1 HP. This helps in letting it set up Toxic Spikes, possibly even two layers, poisoning any grounded Pokemon on the player side. That isn't immune to that status of course. Helping give Diantha an early advantage. When Entry Hazard that hasn't been seen yet up until this point, I would have liked to have given Rosary the Technician ability, but that honestly won't give it too much use outside of if I provide it with a hidden power, but that's something I try to avoid unless it feels fitting for the trainer. Like how I gave it to Morty's team back in Crystal. So aside from that, we just have three high base power attacking moves, and Shadow Ball to help prevent getting walled by Steel types. Out second is Gigalith at level 70 with a sturdy ability and holding a rocky helmet. Its moves are Stone Edge, Earthquake, Heavy Slam, and Stealth Rock. This isn't a regular Gigalith, but a shiny one. I've always loved how shiny Gigalith looks. It's as if crystals are protruding from its body. I feel like this reflects Diantha's high status and wealth. For the moves, we're doubling up on entry hazards here, a Stealth Rock, and Toxic Spikes. Maybe this is being cruel to the players that didn't bring any poison types or hazard removal, but you know what? So be it. The rest of the moves are hard-hitting physical attacks that come off of Gigalith's base 135 attack stat. Rocky Helmet ensures any physical attackers, and heck, even sub-special attackers, like Mons with Grass Knot, take some damage back. Especially with Sturdy ensuring it'll take at least two hits to knock out this Pokemon. Third out is Gorbis at level 70 with a Swift Swim ability and holding the White Herb. His moves are Surf, Ice Beam, Shadow Ball, and Shell Smash. First things first, credit where's due. This Pokemon and most of its moveset was actually suggested by a viewer, Silver Eon. Honestly, I agreed with the reasoning so much, evolving from a clan pearl, which pearls are a sign of wealth and status, and Gorbis itself having a design befitting a character such as Diantha. Also, a water type is a great addition, and helps with the ice type weakness. So shout out to that person, they suggested a great team overall to be honest. Getting back to the moveset though, we have Shell Smash 3 attacks, with White Herb restoring those lowered defences. Like any respectable special attacking water type, we have Surf and Ice Beam, and Shadow Ball helps deal with any resists. Ghost is honestly a really nice type when you need a coverage move that can hit things neutrally. With Gorbis' stats, it should outspeed almost everything after one Shell Smash, and getting a plus 2 to its base 114 special attack will turn this thing into a terrifying sweeper. Fourth will be Pangoro, a level 70 with the Iron Fist ability and holding a black belt. Its moves will be Crunch, Hammer Arm, Poison Jab, and Parting Shot. Some of you may be wondering why I've given Diantha Pangoro. Well, it's because this guy is her security, I suppose. With its intimidating appearance, I'm sure most people would think twice about messing with the world famous actress Diantha. The interesting moves here are Poison Jab for Fairies and Parting Shots to give Diantha a way to switch into a more preferred matchup since the AI doesn't like switching by itself, all while debuffing the player Pokemon's attack and special attack on stage. Lastly, ignoring Stab, Hammer Arm is 100 base power, with Iron Fist that's 120 base power, and with a Black Belt it becomes 144 base power and almost 1.5 times increase in power from its ability and held item alone. The speed drop you get from using Hammer Arm is something Pangoro doesn't really care about, so overall, this is a slow and hard hitter. 
Outfit is Gudra, a level 71, with the Gooey ability and holding an assault vest. Its moves are Dragon Pulse, Sludge Bomb, Earthquake and Fire Blast. With high stats and mixed defensive capabilities, this moveset aims to let Gudra deal with its worst matchups, while having the bulk thanks to the assault vest increasing its already awesome special defense by 1.5 times, which should let it tank a few super effective hits from the special side to be honest. Sludge Bomb is a solid option for fairies, Earthquake deals with steel types, and Fire Blast deals with steel and ice types. Lastly, her Mega Gardevoir is now at level 72 with a Pixelate ability, formerly Synchronize, though that probably won't matter much. Its moves are Moonblast, Psyshock, Thunderbolt, and Calm Mind. Thunderbolt remains to help give some coverage that is lacking on her team, and Calm Mind because a Calm Mind boosted Mega Gardevoir is no joke. This is her final trump card. With sheer power and high stats, this should be an actual final hurdle the player must overcome before becoming the champion. Here's her new team. We swapped out 4 out of 6 Pokemon, and I've tried to make her team reflect her a bit more as a person than a uh, Gorgeist, whatever that was for. Maybe I'm missing the lore on that one though, apologies if I am. Her team was genuinely really hard for me to finalize on. Some other Pokemon I had considered was Furfru, Heartcoat, Nidoqueen, Rotom Forbes depending on the player starter, Zoroark or Ditto for the whole actress pretending to be something else. Even Kecleon got a little moveset drawn up for it since it got pro team. So yeah, this final team I was conflicted, but obviously there's no one right way to make it. So let me know down below a team you'd give Diantha. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Gen 6 offered much more variety in moves, held items, abilities, etc. It made the theory crafting a lot more in depth, which I think has been reflected in the length of my Kalos videos. I'll release a poll soon for the next game we rework, but honestly maybe I should just go back and finish off the Gen 2 videos with the Kanto Gym Leaders. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and have a good day. See ya.